not even gonna ask. <laughs> okay, I am recording. I can take off this note and we can actually start talking. So the uh, uh, let's see, we were de today we're dealing with lessons three and four. Lesson three about object versus process is really you know the deep heavy uh, lesson. This material is, in fact, uh, this is definitely deep stuff. It is not, I am surprised to note that I have never seen anybody in all of my reading talking about this subject. Uh, you know, maybe someday, you know, I'll be Chris Crawford, the discoverer of object versus process something but there's no question in my mind that the idea is immensely important because primarily because it shows up everywhere it's uh it's just a remarkably ubiquitous concept and i think that makes it very important so i uh I want to make sure that you guys really understand this thing. So, uh, shall we plunge into uh, questions here? Did everybody just say, oh, well, yeah, obvious. Anybody can see that. <laughs> I thought it was interesting you made the distinction. Like, because uh, like space time, you know, it's like physics has put them together, but taking the space and the time. It's like a little Newtonian, it's interesting. Yeah, I actually, I've given a lot of thought to that problem that doesn't quite go, doesn't quite go anywhere. It turns out uh, in relativity, it turns out space and time get mixed together. And boy, that issue has caused so many, so much confusion in the world of physics. So uh, we, it is really difficult because you start saying, well, you know, is space really separate from time? And here I am saying, no, space and time are very separate. And in fact, um, it does make sense at the level of physics, so long as you don't start moving at the speed of light or near the speed of light. Maybe the way to say it is that uh, object and process are very distinct. Uh, in non-relativistic environments. Uh, and then you can just say, in relativistic environments, nothing makes sense anyway, so who cares? Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, the, the, the connection with space and time, I think is especially important because it does suggest, um, uh, you know, that we can extract further meaning from that. By the way, I uploaded a new version of that page some days ago. Um, let's see, the biggest difference on it was, um, oh, it had, uh, oh yeah, the difference between linguistics and language, where linguistics has nouns as objects and verbs as processes, where language has vocabulary as object and grammar as process. Uh, did any of you see that latest version? Yeah, yeah, I, I looked through that one. Okay, okay, so anyway, I expanded it. So here comes some questions. I'll ask here, what are your thoughts on object-oriented code being so prominent in most programming practices? Well, that is interesting. Um, object orientation I see as a way of adapting programming to human prejudice, which does make a certain amount of sense. That is, we naturally think in terms of objects and yet code is intrinsically a process. And so in effect, by reframing code in a way to make it look more like object, uh, we make it easier to understand. And in fact, it is. 
uh, easier to understand. That is, people, uh, uh, I mean, there does seem to be a consensus that object-oriented programming um, is easier to grasp and more important, people make fewer mistakes with object-oriented programming than regular standard procedural stuff. So, uh, gee, maybe I should add that to my, uh, let me take a note here, add object orientation as another expression of uh, one more improvement to, uh, to that page. Uh, okay, let's see, from George Dawson. Wouldn't the storytelling have a similar lopsidedness to the data process ratios we see in video games? A five-year-old child has the algorithms of a professional debater, but the debater has much more d data available to them. What is your intuition gut feeling on the object process ratio required for interactive storytelling? How much window dressing is required to sell a game in the mind? Okay, uh, good question. Uh, I would argue though that the uh, the the assumption in this question is that we all start with full process of storytelling, and then we just add more and more data to get better and better storytelling. And and I would disagree with that because I believe there really is a scale of poorer quality storytelling and better quality storytelling. Uh, that is based not so much on data as on the process. Um, that is, a, uh, I have a very good friend who's a science fiction author and has published a number of books. And we've, she served as an advisor on the Storytron project. And she had a great many uh, insightful comments about the nature of the storytelling process. Uh, which greatly illuminated my work with Storytron. Um, so there really is a very sophisticated process involved in good storytelling. Uh, another way to say this is that um, if you were to compile an anthology of children's stories, that is stories created by five-year-olds, you wouldn't find a great deal of diversity. You'd find a, a lot of similarity in, in these stories. Whereas if you compile an anthology of stories by professional authors, you'll see a great deal more diversity, a great deal more richness. So clearly there's something to learn here about the process of storytelling. So I, I think the assumption behind the question uh, doesn't, doesn't take us anywhere. Uh, but what is the object process ratio required for interactive storytelling? Well, what I'll say is that storytelling is intrinsically a process. And so I would argue that story, not story, story is object, it's fixed, it's data. Um, but storytelling is a process. Um, the example I like to use is um, something that doesn't happen that much these days because we have such a, uh, uh, oversupply of wonderful stories that, uh, there's not such a need for it anymore, but storytellers throughout history were an important component of culture. And a good storyteller was a valued person in many cultures. There is a specific role for the storyteller. And typically, in fact, there is a fairly, I'd say almost universal style, or at least a very common style for how cultures have storytellers. Typically, the storyteller, <clears throat> 
is a wandering person. He is not part a fixed part of any community because he only has so many stories and people, you know, can't afford to spend every night listening to stories. So basically he wanders from community to community. And when he arrives, he's, he's an honored guest and he's well fed and well, uh, you know, they, they give him gifts and so forth. Hooray for the storyteller. And then in the evening he sits down and uh, uh, everybody gathers around and somebody will say, oh, oh, tell the story about Grammy Kos. And he said, oh yes, Gramikos. And then he starts telling the story about Gramikos, whatever. We know now anthropologists have figured out a great deal about how these people operate. And I might as well tell you that long story now. Um, Homer was one of these people. Uh, these people were still operating in what is now Yugoslavia as late as the 1930s. Uh, and in fact, one scholar spent a lot of time following some of these people around, peppering them with questions and figuring out how they operated. And the basic concept is that, no, they don't memorize the story. They memorize the general thrust of the story and many of the details of the story. But uh, they Oh, frequently these people accompanied their uh, presentation with uh, uh, a weak music performance. They weren't, you know, blasting away on the drums or whatever. They might typically they might have a harp or a small stringed instrument and, you know, would strum it occasionally with different chords and that's about all. Anyway, um, they did have a big dictionary in their head of phrases with particular um, meters and rhyming elements. And so here's this guy and he's got all these tinker toys of language. And typically, and in fact, we see these in Homer. Uh, there are all these standard phrases that keep showing up over and over. There's the wine dark sea, Owl-eyed Athena, rosy-fingered dawn. Um, and the reason these phrases show up over and over is that the guy is trying to tell a more than just straight exposition. He's, he's trying to be a little poetic. He's trying to get a nice meter and some rhyming every now and then. And so he's got his tinker toys and as he's going, he grabs Tinker Toys and assembles them into the next line and then presents that line while he's coming up with the next set of Tinker Toys. This is all done on the fly, but he has such a rich set of stuff that he has memorized so well that he can just, you know, uh, uh, throw it all together while he's talking. Uh, he will also have a large repertoire of uh, what I'll call standard stories. Um, that's why people would say, tell, tell us the one about so-and-so, because everybody knows, yeah, yeah, there's a really great story about him. And in fact, the evolution of these things, it's very interesting how these things evolve. The Arthurian legend, well, some of the standard ones, the, the, the Homeric legends, which were actually, we think were very much in flux. In fact, all of these are in flux until they get written down and then they get frozen. Um, but the Arthurian legends are the ones we know best because we have history on those things going way, way back and they have changed enormously and the culture has used them uh, very effectively. I mean, the Arthurian legends started off the very earliest ones go back, we think, about at least 4,000 years. The reason we know that is that in one of the legends, they mention that Merlin got the stones for Stonehenge from a place in Wales, and he flew them in overnight from Wales to, uh, to the site of Stonehenge, and they, they 
say where he got them. Well, in the 1950s, they did chemical analyses of the stones at Stonehenge and found that they, they came from the Preseli Mountains in Wales. In fact, they were able to zero in on exactly where the quarry was. And they got it right 4,000 years ago, or at least the Arthurian legends now uh, got it right. Now, the only way they could have known that was if that information had been transmitted continuously for 4,000 years. And that's very impressive. So we know that those basic legends go back at least that far. And in fact, if you think about it, every culture is going to have its stories and they're just going to keep telling the same stories, but they're going to be modified over the course of time. And uh, you can see that we don't know all the modifications that came up prior to uh, the first written versions of the Arthurian legends. We have good reason to believe that the er, that before uh, 500 current era, uh, Arthur was not the hero. K was. Um, uh, for a variety of reasons, a number of scholars have said, you know, K was probably the hero in the earlier ones. And then came the, uh, uh, it, around 430 or 440 in the current era, the Saxons were invited into, in, the Roman army left Britain to go fight in a civil war. And they had nobody to defend them, so they invited some Saxons, Hengist and Horsa, over to uh, to Britain. You, know, you help defend us from the bad guys. And uh, the Saxons started taking over. They started expanding from southwest, the southeast England, uh, westward, and uh, they were steadily pushing the uh, the people there. They were a Celtic people, but they had been Romanized. And so we call them Britons, uh, not Celts. And, uh, and they spoke a vulgar form of, of Latin. Not, they did not speak a Celtic language. Anyway, the, well, the ones in the far west did. They spoke Cant, Cornish and in Wales, they continued with Welsh. Um, anyway, the... Uh, uh, Arthur, by, by about 480, things were getting to be really bad for the Celtic peoples. And that's when somebody showed up. They call him Arthur. And in fact, they're good. They're, there was definitely a war leader, a general, or somebody who led a counterattack, culminating in a big battle at Mount Baden where they crushed the Saxons and threw them back. But they didn't, uh, they didn't, they weren't able to reconquer all their lands. They simply stopped the Saxon advance for like 30 years. Um, and so great victory, hooray for this Arthur guy, whomever he was. And, uh, but then after about 30 years, the Saxons resumed their advance and they drove the Britons out. Many of them fled to northeastern France, which had been pretty much emptied out by a combination of war there and plague. And so they settled there, and that area is now called Brittany, after the Britons who fled there. And they spoke, I, I, I was wrong when I said they didn't speak a Celtic language. Yes, the, the common people all spoke a Celtic language. The leadership continued to speak Latin. That was the language of the sophisticates. So they brought their Celtic language with them. Uh, uh, and that was the language they spoke there. And the important thing is, once they got to uh, Brittany, they, had, they started taking the legends of Kay, the mighty military hero, and they inserted Arthur, you know, someday Arthur's going to come back and we're going to get our homeland back. And that was the basic form of all these legends. We're not going to get rid of Kay. I mean, if you're telling a story about Kay and then you start putting Arthur into it, you don't kill Kay. 
you make Kay Arthur's half brother. And so he stays in and he's still a mighty hero, but he's subordinate to Arthur. So anyway, these legends for hundreds of years were resurrection legends. You know, someday Arthur will come back and save us all. But then from Brittany, they spread into France. I'm taking too long with this story. I'll try to be a little briefer. Um, they spread into France and they were picked up by the jongleurs, the uh, French, the French storytellers who went from castle to castle, only they needed to make it appropriate to their audiences. So instead of being about, you know, we're going to reconquer Britain, they made it about chivalry and, uh, you know, noble love of a knight for, uh, for a lady. And so they rearranged it. Oh, yeah, we can't have Arthur as the greatest hero. We got to have a French hero, Lancelot. And that's how he got in. And uh, boy, the French really ran wild with that. And in fact, the legend all from France spread into Germany and Italy. Uh, if you're ever in Modena in northern Italy, check the uh, architrave of the big church at Medina, they have a thing showing Arthur and some of the other knights. Um, let's see. And from, then the next big step was uh, Thomas Mallory, an English ne'er-do-well who got thrown in prison. While he was in prison, he decided he'd keep himself busy by writing down all the legends he knew. Apparently he knew all of this stuff, so he wrote it all down. And this was around 1485, and a British and English publisher by the name of Thomas Caxton said, hey, well, I'll publish this. And, uh, and they published it, and it, uh, it, became, it was a bestseller, big hit, great stories. They were all pretty much, uh, the knight loved the lady and said these nice things to her. Then he went out and fought another knight. Bang, 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 bang. And then he encountered another knight and he fought him. Bang, 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 bang. And it just goes on and on and on like this. Anyway, uh, big hit. Everybody was talking King Arthur and it was a big show. And then Cervantes came along and he decided, you know, we're getting sick and tired of all this Arthur Knight stuff. So he did a satire on it called uh, uh, Don Quixote. And uh, it was just a straight satire on the Arthurian things. And that kind of shut it all up and it all died for a few hundred years. And then in the early 19th century, they started picking up on it again. What's his name did his poem, Once and Future King. and. Uh, then uh, Mark Twain came in and did uh, uh, his satire on it, where the knights are riding bicycles. And then uh, in the 20th century, this is where it gets really impressive. We get King Arthur as a Walt Disney cartoon, a Broadway uh, theatrical, uh, Women's Lib, the Miss of, Miss of Aval Avalon. I mean, it was used for everything. And that shows how powerful the legends are. You can, you can rearrange them for anything. Anyway, uh, the point here is that you can use a basis like that and apply new processes to the old data and come up with a completely new story. So uh, uh, anyway, that's this, the point of all of this is that storytelling is primarily a process. It's handy when you use pre-existing data because then your audience doesn't have to come up to speed on a completely new, I mean like consider the matrix. You really do have to come up to speed on this really strange world. And that was one of the problems they faced in making the movie and they did a very good job of introducing you to the world. Uh, how much window dressing is required to sell a game in the market? Is this why we see data ratios so large? Well, for games, yes. Uh, the problem here is, I, I believe I spoke earlier about audience engineering. Uh, 
the there's a dynamic that takes place between the audience and the creators. It's, it is not so simple as, well, we're just, you know, businessmen and the audience demands this and we give them what they want. They define what's, what's right. It doesn't work that way at all. The, the artists are always pushing the audience and the audience is pushing back. Uh, I'll give you an example of the pushing process. By the way, I probably told you this before, but I'm going to tell you it again. I have no idea what I told you last week or previous weeks. I sometimes repeat my stories. If I start telling a story you've already heard, just, you know, wave your hand, shut up, whatever, so that I can move on. Um, anyway, this story is a good example of audience in engineering in cinema audiences had to learn how to read cinema. A very good example of this was er, very early in the cinema, D.W. Griffith did the first close-ups. Now, audiences still thought in terms of theater, plays, where you saw the body, that the whole person walks out on the stage, says, hello, you know, to be or not to be, and that's what they expected. And then D.W. Griffiths gets this idea, wait, why do we have to stand way back? Why don't we do a close up on the face so they can really show the emotions? And so he did that and it really put off a lot of audiences because they thought, oh my God, a talking head, where did they cut off his head? Um, and some people, not all people, but this was difficult for audiences to get used to. And in fact, the whole history of cinema is artists coming up with these new ways of doing things. The, uh, above all, the sequencing um, uh, and the way you present information. The, the, uh, another great example. Have you seen uh, that the, um, the Battleship Potemkin, the classic scene from the Battleship Potemkin where the Cossacks are marching down the st steps at, Ode at Odessa. This is one of, one of the most famous scenes in movie history. And what's important about it is that basically the little story he's telling is that there's a crowd of people on the, there's this huge flight of steps, you know, like 50 feet wide and 200 feet high. And there's a crowd of people protesting there and the government brings in soldiers, Cossack soldiers who are particularly brutal. And they take their rifles and they shoot straight into the crowd and people are dying. And then the Cossacks have their bayonets out and they start marching down the steps. And you better run because if you stay, they're going to bayonet you. And, but the way he presents it, he shows feet going down the steps. And he gives you the point of view from, there's a student who, who's sort of crouching somewhere and he's looking on in horror, it's what's happening. He shows this from a very, from multiple points of view. You never actually see the entire event, the big picture. You get all sorts of little pictures that you stitch together in your mind to get the big picture. And that was a huge leap forward in cinema. So all these kinds of things, but the example I will, that I like most is much more recent. My parents' generation, the way they saw cinema was with the Saturday morning uh, movies. They, they'd you know, pay a nickel and they'd get into the theater and they'd be there for like three hours and the, the people would show some cartoons and a movie and a few other things and then the kids would, would come home. Uh, and so my parents, their only, that was their only experience with video, about three hours once a week at the very best, and typically you know, once every second, third, fourth week. So they hadn't seen much video. My generation though, when I was a little kid, we had television. And my parents found that television was a great way to get rid of us. You know, go watch TV or watch TV after school. Boy, that was very common. And on Saturday mornings. And uh, 
So boy, we saw lots and lots of TV. I mean, uh, uh, the Mickey Mouse Club and all sorts of stuff. And so by the time I was in my 20s, I had seen literally thousands of hours of video. And I, I was familiar with video. I was video literate. And then along came George Lucas and Steven Spielberg. And they basically realized that they could do some, they could take advantage of the audience engineering. That in fact, the audience had changed. And in effect, they announced this in a revolutionary scene at the very beginning of uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. And I, I urge you to go back and look at this scene. I'm sure it's somewhere on YouTube. And, uh, but look at it, if possible, frame by frame. The starting point is, you know, they're walking through the jungle and then they come to this creek with a waterfall. And you haven't even seen Indiana Jones. You've only seen him from behind. And he stands at the edge of the creek and he's got these old, old fragments of a map that he's kind of holding together and he's looking around and he kind of, he nods his head. And you're seeing him from behind. Meanwhile, the bad guy sneaks up from behind a tree and he pulls out his gun and he cocks it, click. And then movie history. In the next three and a half seconds, there are seven separate shots in three and a half seconds. In those shots, basically, I looked at, anybody can look and see, can see what happened. Basically, Indiana Jones grabs his whip, whirls around, goes Wait! with the whip, knocks the pistol out of the bad guy's hand, and it goes off and the bad guy runs away. Um, but if you, if you actually look at it, you are, will be amazed at how little he actually shows. You see for half a second, a hand grabbing a whip. Uh, you see for another half second, a hand holding the whip handle going over the head. You don't even see the head. All you see is the hat and the hand and the whip handle. Uh, there, is a, there is a shot that nobody, consciously sees you, you have fun showing people the thing and saying all right list the actual shots that were taken and typically they'll 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 see five shots when there are actually seven the one shot they always miss is a reaction shot basically it's from a little further away you see the hand coming down with the whip handle and you see in the background, the porter, the Indian porter, uh, who's looking towards the target of the whip, and he goes, oh! Nobody ever sees that. It's totally subliminal. Um, anyway, the point here, I understood that old people, old people my age understood it, but my parents complained, I just, I couldn't understand what was happening in that movie. There were all sorts of things that just happened and I didn't get it. That's the idea of audience engineering. The audience was prepared for a much faster pace. Um, and in fact, the, now I'll actually answer your question. Uh, the games industry, the games audience has a whole bunch of expectations about what comprises a game. There are zillions of different kinds of games that could be made that are still games that could be entertaining that could be made right now but they don't fit the expectations of the audience and so they will fail um the uh, actually i've experienced some of that i've done a couple of games where the critics said, well, very impressive, very creative, and has a lot of interesting ideas in it, but you know, it's just not fun. And what they really mean by that is, it doesn't meet my expectations of games, and therefore, it's not fun. Um, so that is the problem we face with, you know, window dressing, it's not so much window dressing 
as fitting the standard, fitting the mold. Uh, let's see, uh, reading the articles, this process material reminded me of Whitehead's process philosophy. Is that related to your understanding of process here? I have no idea. Uh, Albert Whitehead just, uh, I've, I made a couple attempts at him and just said, ah, I can't handle it. Uh, he's, he's pretty dense. <laughs> Let's see, related to storytellers, wouldn't computer storytelling be similar to procedurally generated musical composition? Yes and no. Uh, in both music and story, there may be the motifs that are artfully strung together in the mind of the artist, since computers are still not good at making interesting music. Why do you think computers are ready to make interesting stories? Okay. Um, music, I suppose the way I'll say it is, it's one dimensional. I don't mean that it's narrow. I mean that it proceeds in time and at any given instant, you have one particular envelope of sound. Whereas stories can wander all over the damn place. Uh, another way to express it is, theoretically, we could do um, what the, uh, well, actually, in fact, I did this. Um, here's an interesting algorithm for procedural genera uh, generation. Let's start with Edgar Allan Poe, uh, his story, The Gold Bug, where these guys uh, get this letter or, or this message that's in secret code. And what they do, they figure out what it is by a frequency analysis. That is, they say, you know, in the English language, E is the most common letter. So let's go through here and find the most common letter. Ah, yeah, it's this one. Wherever we see that, we're going to replace it by an E. And then uh, they go through the other letters of the alphabet that way, and they're able to decode the thing. This is called frequency analysis. And it was, <laughs> everybody knew it. Uh, at the time of Poe. Um, and so that type of cipher is very primitive, easily cracked. The interesting thing though is you can turn it around and use it to generate text. In fact, I believe there was a Scientific American article in the 1970s that described the algorithm. What you do is you take the entire body of Shakespeare and you put it on the computer. Then you go through and you do a frequency analysis of individual letters, and that'll be very close to the standard. But then you do a frequency analysis of letter pairs. How often is Q followed by X? Never, but Q is always followed by U. And so you find characteristic frequency pairs. Then you do triplets, quadruplets, quintuplets. You go as far as you can. Of course, your tables of frequencies get stupendous very quickly. But if you got a big enough computer and enough computer time, you can do this. And in fact, that's what they did. Now, once you've got those frequency tables, let's say you go up to five letters long. Then you turn around and uh, you pick, you get a random number in between zero and one, and you use that to select one letter based on the frequency tables. That is, there's a good chance it'll be an E. Um, let's say you get a T, okay? Now you go to the pairwise tables, and you say, all right, what's the probability that this will be followed by an A or a B or a C? You roll another random number and you pick a letter. Then you do the triplets and the quadruplets, and then you do this running window. Uh, actually, it's even more complex than that because for the very first uh, letter, you don't just look at the single frequency. You say, well, how many pairs begin with this letter? How many triplets begin with this letter? And so forth. When you do this, you can end up putting out, or you know, outputting, a string of characters that kind of looks, reads like Shakespeare. Um, 
they had difficulty getting anywhere with Shakespeare. But I repeated that about 30 years ago with a game I did called Guns and Butter. I had a system where I had to come up with names for uh, countries. And everybody likes to make up their, their own little list of names. But I wanted something that could gener procedurally generate names of countries. And that, in fact, is exactly what I did. I used a set of Mongol and Turkish words. A, because I had a large set of them, and B, because they have a rather exotic feel to them that is unfamiliar to most people, which means I can get away with sloppiness. I actually tried to do English town names because there are so many of them. There's an even bigger data set of those. And they really do follow a lot of standard sequences, you know, Chippenham, uh, Bartlesby, uh, West, <laughs> wait, West Monstros, uh, and so on. It, it just, they, they really are. Uh, we, <laughs> when we were driving through Britain, we had loads of fun deliberately mispronouncing the names of towns like Munchkinhampton. So, uh, Anyway, um, so you can, anything that is just a sequence, you can uh, get the frequency tables for it, reverse them, and generate your own sequences. And that is the first order simple approximation for how to do procedurally generated music. That's the simplest, dumbest way to do it, and it doesn't work very well. Uh, but a lot of scientists have, have worked on better ways and they still haven't done very well. Although somebody did something pretty good with Mahler, I think. Anyway, um, because in fact, it is it really is multidimensional when you talk about durations, uh, the, you know, the volume levels, the pauses, it can get messy. Anyway, the, uh, but you can do this with storytelling, presumably. And in fact, a Russian fellow named Vladimir Prop in the 1920s and 30s attempted this with Russian folk tales. He, uh, he extracted a number of standard motifs, uh, you know, like, like the, the Wicked Witch or the Fire Breathing Dragon or, um, you know, little kids in the forest alone. Um, and he reduced them to a set, of, each one was reduced to a symbol. And then you could write a folk tale by just assembling these symbols. Well, he wrote a book on it. You can get it on Amazon. It doesn't work. Uh, what was the guy's name? Vladimir Prop, P-R-O-P-P. -P. And uh, uh, it's, it's an interesting exercise, but no, it doesn't work. And if you're gonna do that, you really wanna do, use the Arnett Thompson catalog. I, I told you about Arnett Thompson last week, and that's a much larger set of motifs. Even then though, it's sort of like, they're, they're disconnected, they're all objects. Uh, very few processes. There are a few little processes mixed in, you know, the, the knight slays the dragon, something like that. But they really don't combine naturally. And so uh, you'd need to create your own rules of chemistry where you, in effect, for each motif, you define a kind of valence that says, well, you know, you know, the fire breathing dragon fits together with the knight. Uh, he doesn't fit together with the little kids alone in the forest. And so you got to come up with some sort of connection system. And that would be a huge task, but that's how you would do that. Um, so, yeah, if you want to do a simple combinatorial thing, that's how you do it. My way of doing it procedurally is to do character interaction based on algorithms for character reactions to events. So that's the very, very short way of uh, explaining it. Um, uh, da, 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 a comment, live storytelling is interactive. Yes, 
audience feedbacks with storyteller. However, that's seldom the, the the, if you think of the interaction in terms, did I give you the definition of interaction where you talk about information content flow and you multiply the amount of information flowing each way? Well, the amount of information the audience can feed back to the uh, storyteller is pretty low. So yeah, you're getting interaction, but it's rather low intensity interaction. It's much better. The version I prefer is grandpa and little Annie and grandpa's putting Annie to bed and Annie says tell me a story Gramps and and he says well yeah sure once upon a time there was a little girl who had a horse and Annie says was it a white horse and he says oh yes it was so white and he starts talking and he doesn't so much say okay she they rode up and she could take either the left road or the right road which one do you want it wasn't like a choose your own adventure she's participating in the process she's jumping in on her own initiative with things uh that she wants to see in the story and he integrates them right into his story and a very important part of this is that a lot of storytellers resent this kind of thing and they say, yeah, but they, they're going to ruin my story. Well, I'd like to point out that Grandpa does not say, shut up, you brat. I'm trying to tell a story here, and you're messing it up. You know, that's, that's not how it works. So, you know, keep that in mind. Uh, let's see. Uh, a bit like the shark and uh, I'm struck by this statement in the reading. Everything we know about expression is object-driven. That would suggest to computer that computers are the first medium to express by process. Yes, that's what makes computers revolutionary. So how does, in your view, uh, how does it in you tell a story through process rather than by object? The computer can be equipped, theoretically, with the same algorithms that are going on inside grandpa's head. Now, you got to admit, those are going to be pretty rich algorithms, and it's, it's not going to be easy. But theoretically, there is no reason. I mean, Grandpa is not, uh, you know, Leo Tolstoy or Mark Twain. He's just Grandpa. And yet, he can still tell a great story. We can all tell stories. Basic storytelling is fairly easy. So, we need to figure out how to get those algorithms inside a computer. And again, I want to emphasize, this is not easy. It will not take place in my lifetime. Uh, you know, we'll, we're talking about a decades long project, but I think I have successfully scratched the surface. And uh, so I, Having scratched the surface, I now step back and say, all right, you're the surgeon, you got the scalpel, uh, you uh, put a new heart in him, you know, whatever. So uh, you get to do the hard work. Uh, but yes, it is important to recognize the computer really is revolutionary. It is changing the world in ways far more powerful than any medium before it. I mean, movies, sure, they had an effect, but I mean, suppose for some weird reason, movies and television were never created. That, you know, God made a law saying there shall be no video. And uh, our society would still not be that much different. Whereas computers have changed everything. Uh, they are truly uh, a revolutionary. And the essence of that revolution is the fact that they can process information. And so that's what you got to run with. Uh, this is a variation on the idea of, uh, you know, what is the basis of your competitive advantage? If you want to get ahead in the world, you got to identify what you're good at and what you're bad at and you want to avoid the stuff you're bad at and concentrate on the stuff you're good at. And the computer is good at processing. 
So stop wasting time stuffing data into the damn thing and start getting it processing. Lorenzo, did you have a question? Yeah, um, about, um, you said if, if uh, like if God um, said uh, no video and uh, no movies, um, uh, it wouldn't change a lot uh, about uh, human, uh, uh, but it changed a lot about uh, our dreams, for example. Uh, because of the way movies uh, uh, are telling stories, um, we make dreams uh, that are like uh, uh, shots. We, we dreams of um, I don't know. For example, I had I had a dream like uh, last week, who was uh, a time lapse. You know, I saw like um, a body uh, uh, decompose uh, in a fast. Uh, accelerated uh, motion, you know, like uh, you see a, a guy and then he becomes a skeleton. This is an image that is uh, purely made uh, made because cameras can uh, take a time lapse of a flower shrinking. Uh, you can't see in the nature a flower shrinking in, a, in fast motion. This is a purely like a, a, an image that exists because uh, video cameras exist. So this kind of image and a lot of uh, way uh, uh, of telling stories uh, changed a lot because of movies. So I think I can't dream like, uh, and you can say that, uh, for example, you can uh, video games made uh, a lot of, uh, you see a lot of images of, um, for example, a person in third person view. And this kind of uh, images uh, didn't, really existed uh, before uh, video games. Like movies uh, took this idea of following a, a guy from behind and uh, the camera isn't present, it's like a, a god uh, watching this guy uh, walking. So I think that uh, cinema changed the way we think about images and the way we think. Yes, cinema did change the way we think about images, but that is not a fundamental change. That's not a revolutionary change. Moreover, our perception of dreams. Psy psychologists have noted that people now describe dreams using uh, concepts from video. But in fact, people were talking about dreams as stories long before video came along. Uh, was it Freud who wrote the book Analysis of Dreams? Yeah. Uh, you know, and there are lots of, of stories. Herodotus, 2,000 years, 2,500 years ago tells a story about a king who had a dream and somebody who interprets it for him. Genghis Khan, there's a story about him having a dream. So yeah, yeah, I mean, people have always interpreted dreams as stories. That's because stories, in my opinion, are the standard, one of the standard data structures of the human brain. And so if you got all this random material, which is what dreams really are, you just automatically stuff it into that that uh, mold and that data structure and interpret that random data as a story. Um, so I don't think they've made a, you know a major change in society. Certainly not a revolutionary change in society. Not not anywhere near on the level of computers. So computers. Are you follow up question? Uh, yeah, like uh, for example, um, you say. Ideally, uh, we would make a, a game or a software that is better than grandpa at telling stories. But uh, it's, uh, it seems to be very hard to do like a, a virtual grandpa, you know, like a yeah. virtual storyteller. This yeah. would be very, really hard. But what would be the next step? Uh, theoretically, like uh, what would be better than uh, someone to tell stories? Well, what would the computer have more? I'm convinced, no, I shouldn't say I'm convinced. I am now experimenting. I, I've built all sorts of technologies that do parts of the thing. And I thought I had achieved a critical mass of technologies and you know, I would blow up the world with my wonderful new invention. Um, but uh, in fact, I, I did not achieve critical mass. I achieved what's called rapid disassembly. 
Okay, I'm gonna tell you that story. Great digression, totally inappropriate. Um, <laughs> people who design nuclear weapons, um, they, uh, you know, it, it's actually very difficult to get one of these things to explode. You gotta have these compression waves squeezing the uranium to super density and only then will it explode. And if there's any error or miscalculation or whatever, you don't get a nice satisfying kaboom. You get something that they refer to as rapid disassembly. And this could still be what civilians call an explosion, but it's not a real nuclear explosion. So we say oh, rapid disassembly. Anyway, uh, that's the level I've reached with my technology, but I'm pursuing another idea now that might actually work this time, who knows. Um, but I do have another suggestion and that concerns the verbs. Um, there are so many verbs for human interaction, it's easy to be overwhelmed and to say, you know, what do I include? What do I reject? How can you reject some of the verbs and include others? It seems so artificial. Well, I suggest that one good way to do this is to start with a core skeleton of verbs. And I believe that the best skeleton of verbs are the verbs that I call statements of affinity. Uh, those are um, things like, I like Mary a lot, but eh, I don't like Joan as much. And you know, I really hate Susan. Um, that's first order statements of affinity, and that's easy to do. Uh, next is second order uh, statements of affinity. Joan hates Tom, but Joan really likes Mary. Um, and in fact, I had this technology running 36 years ago with a game called Gossip for the Atari. And you might want to look it up. Uh, it was actually a very cute game. And um, it, really playable. It was not ultimately, you know, a real meat on your bones kind of game. It, it was interesting for the potentials it pointed to, but uh, it, it didn't really solve the problem. So my suggestion is that you start off with something along those lines and then ask, how can I expand this a little? Um, I also did another version of Gossip much more recently. Uh, it was in Java and uh, it is up on my website in the software section. You can download it and play it if you wish. It's still pretty much the same game. It has a much improved user interface and uh, you know, cosmetics are better and so forth. But uh, um, that will give you an idea of what I consider to be a good starting point, a good core around which to build a much more satisfying game. So, uh, let's see, uh, la, 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 la. by verbs of affinity, do you mean that verbs that define relationships between people? Yes, and I'm speaking narrowly of verbs about how people like or dislike each other. But there are other dimensions of human relationship. For example, trust. Another one is dominance. Uh, you know, you're kind of scared of that guy. And, you know, if he says, shut up, you go ahead and shut up. Um, so um, you, you can do multidimensional. And in fact, you could do a whole lot of different dimensions. I caution you, don't throw a whole lot of dimensions at the problem. Start off with affinity as your core and then ask, well, what else could I do? For example, you could enclose it in some kind of mystery game where you're trying to figure out who the murderer is. 
that would uh, make trust a valuable, relevant personality uh, relationship. Uh, you could do, there are a bunch of other things. You could do a, a leadership kind of thing where dominance plays an important role. So I would suggest you, you keep it to in just two relationships for the time being. In fact, do one first. And once you've got that down, then start adding more. And, uh, you know, then conquer the world. Uh, hate, love, first and sorter, second order intentionality is how I've seen that referred to before. Uh, yeah, I, I have a different personality model. In fact, a personality system. And we will be talking about that. Let me briefly uh, run through lesson four. We've already discussed much of it. Uh, the computer is a processing machine. And again, the idea here is the emphasis on processing. That's what computers do. And the flaw in games is that we put far too much data and uh, too little processing into uh, our games. Now, as it happens, the way I measured it is seriously flawed. I just, you know, how much of the, of the, you know, we, if you downloaded the product, how many of the bytes that you get are data bytes and how many are process bytes? Well, that's measuring process in terms of data. Uh, you know, <laughs> bytes are data. And so that's a little misleading. You could also, <clears throat> possibly measure cycles. How many cycles are spent doing interesting number crunching? Uh, in fact, that's, that's an old concept I've used. I, I like to differentiate between two basic types of processing. One is what I call shoveling data. You know, okay, here's some image, shovel it out to the screen. Here's some sound, shovel that out to the, to the speaker, you know, and all you're doing is shoveling data around. That really isn't using a computer very well at all. Where the computer is really good is when it's crunching numbers, when it's adding them and subtracting them, multiplying them, uh, uh, doing an exclusive or, you know, when it's putting numbers together and coming up with new numbers. Crunching numbers is you know, when you're doing a lot of that, you're doing it right. So uh, that's, now, uh, yes, Boolean operations like sorting and so forth. Yeah, those are, those are also crunching. I don't consider them to be as, as crunchy as the arithmetic operations, because basically Boolean operations are arithmetic operations with one bit. And my feeling is, you know, eight bits or 16 or 64, that's, that's more crunching. So, uh, and in fact, we'll be getting to this. I'm, I'm building up to this point. I'm, I'm setting you up for this. So, uh, uh, yes, you want to be crunching. And in fact, if you look at most computers right now, most software, it does a lot more shoveling than crunching. And as far as I see it, that's a waste of computer cycles. It's an abuse of a computer. Let's see. Uh, All other media are object-centered was written in the fourth lecture. What about uh, improv theater? Isn't it a process? Oh boy, improv, yes, because improv is made up on the fly. However, the question, it, in a sense, you could say jazz is a process because it's made on the fly, except that in both cases, for example, in jazz, the musicians don't just get up on the stage and say, okay, let's just play some notes here. They've done lots of rehearsals. They've worked together for months. They know each other and they kind of know where the other guy will take off on a riff and, uh, uh they have a it's rather like the uh the traditional storyteller i was telling you about uh in both the case of improv and jazz the artist has this huge collection of tinker toys 
and has a really good feeling for how they fit together. And so he, in real time, yes, he's taking the Tinker Toys and assembling them. Um, but that is not necessarily interactive and in fact can be completely non-interactive. I mean, can you imagine a jazz quartet up on the stage and somebody shouts, you know, faster! <laughs> They're just gonna throw them out. Uh, so, uh, uh, in the same way, in improv, there the audience doesn't really you know, make her more vulnerable. Uh, you know, you don't you don't see that in improv, and so there's no interaction. Yes, there's still process, but it's more of an assembly than than it's it's sort of real time shoveling, not number crunching. When trying to make humanoid robots, we begin to make brains instead of bodies. They made real progress and focused on the body, then the mind. Uh, could we make the same process in relationship software? For example, trying to make a simulation of lobster relationship, hierarchy, serotonin, and relaxing going forward. Oh, uh, an ontology, an ontogeny of game design following the phylogeny of human storytelling. Uh, I actually wrote an essay about that process. Maybe we should start off with children's stories. You know, just tell really simple stories that, you know, can interact with a five-year-old. And in fact, there that's where a number of people started. Um, those all fizzled out. I don't think that, uh, is necessarily bad uh, because I think they underestimated the sophistication of even children's storytelling. Uh, I'm going to ask you to wait for about a minute and a half while I run down to my library to get something to show you. Oh, take your time. Take your time. Oh, no. <laughs> wonder how far away his library is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so funny so funny i was cracking up over here just just imagining like going to like a community theater and going like emote more be more sympathetic <laughs> could you imagine they, they they'd stop in they'd stop the play in shakespeare's I you get time with, um, i suppose you get it with comedy don't you yeah like in shakespeare's time there was a pit um, in the globe where the pit is where the drunken people would shout at the actors during the play. And it was almost like a social hub then. And they would shout things at the actors. And, and nice. I, I mean, it wasn't really interactive. Like, it wasn't really interactive like Chris is saying. But um, yeah, shouting things that stay on stage is not oh, well, they very might common. Have, they <laughs> might have changed the dialogue, you know, with the right little jab from the crowd. They might have been forced to. The, the other example I was thinking of was D and D. So, like, you've obviously got a much more kind of natural back and forth between the audience and the um, the what's the what's the term the uh, the the, the storyteller. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's really interesting too, because it's like there's not like an NPC character. It's like that NPC can later, like that game master can bring him in and. Uh, very organic fashion. It's like anyone you yeah. meet in one of those games could be the villain. Uh, I did a yeah. small game like that where a player had a book and he chose some paths, you know, like a book that tells your own story. So you press on the book, there's a small Arduino, you know, behind the book. He presses and the other guy, it's an asymmetric gameplay, so the other guy is in a virtual reality and he sees different stories depending on the storyteller choices. So it's uh, like a, a symmetrical gameplay, like a, one storyteller and one, like, a, you know, uh, nice. uh, hero. That's well, interesting. I'm sorry to say I could not find it. Obviously, I have been, uh, uh, you know, a thief has snuck into my house to take this valuable book. It is sorry. my little golden book of uh, The Little Mermaid. Now, do you remember the little golden books? They were little books you got when you were a little kid. And they were very short. Uh, and they would take some story. And it was, 
you know, half the page was a picture and the other half was, you know, 64 point type, you know, really big so that those eyes have no problem telling the letters. Um, I got that book and went through it. I mean, this was a very simplified version of The Little Mermaid. And I went through it counting unique verbs. Now, again, I wanna emphasize this book is aimed at, you know, like five-year-olds. I counted 126 unique verbs in that book, which suggests if you wanna have a story that works even for just five-year-olds, you're gonna need at least 100 verbs. That's how complicated storytelling can be. So uh, here's another way of thinking about interactive storytelling. I'm gonna get back, see, I was trained as a physicist, so I'm gonna get back to nuclear bombs. Um, with nuclear bombs, you have something called a critical mass. That is, you cannot make nuclear firecrackers. They're just, they don't work small. They only work big. Uh, and so there's a minimum size. And the same thing applies to interactive storytelling. There is a minimum size to the verb set of interactive storytelling in order for it to work. Uh, you've got to have, at the very least, a hundred unique verbs. That's a lot of verbs, I can tell you. I've, I've done a bunch. Getting about 30 is easy. 50, it's starting to get harder. Um, I had something like 70 in one of my attempts. And uh, I was pushing up to 100 with the C-boot when I uh, gave up on it. So this is difficult stuff. And, and you simply cannot make a little version of interactive storytelling. It just doesn't work until you reach a certain minimum size. Did it feel better as you were adding more verbs, the stories uh, that were generated? Yes, yes. The stories did have a greater sense of dramatic power. That is, I mean, you were doing more different kinds of things. You were interacting with the other characters in, uh, in a deeper way. You, the, there was more indirection. And so, uh, so it de more verbs definitely make it better. But there, the difficulty of getting a verb set to work is you know, some kind of exponential function of the number of verbs. So uh, it, it's difficult. Uh, let's see, time as a process. How important is cadence and rhythm? to a conversation abstraction. Uh, I think there you're getting way uh, beyond uh, where we are right now. Uh, yes, in real spoken conversation, cadence and rhythm are important. Um, they are useful indicators. They are especially important in formal speech, like when I give a speech in public, and I'm preparing it, I definitely pay attention to uh, cadence and rhythm. Uh, but it really does have a powerful effect on people. But it's difficult, difficult to do it on the fly. And uh, even, in, even in a prepared presentation, it can be difficult to assemble. So it really, it's more a matter of you get little, um, little fragments of it here and there through the speech. Is the development of a workforce workflow required to perfect interactive storytelling? Like how Hollywood is an industry, yes. Um, do we need specialization? Boy, this is a tough problem because right now we don't know what we're doing. Uh, and so it's, it's very difficult to, uh, to divide the work among people to, uh, uh, you know, assign tasks. Yes, it can be done. I would actually recommend against it. And in fact, this is one of the problems. Right now, I think we need the unity of a single mind, but we also need 
big size. So how does a single mine do uh, an Apollo project? Uh, that's, that's part of the problem too. Uh, but when I have thought, I, with Seaboot, I recruited about half a dozen people to assist me, but they weren't simply not able to get into the places where I really needed help. There was a particular, I, I, I saw one possibility for an algorithm writer. I'm sorry, this had better be my wife. Take your time. My wife was saying, it's 11.15, why aren't you done yet? I talk too much, uh, but we better wrap this up. Uh, I gotta put a, door, a doorbell in my office. That's a nice little... <laughs> well, actually the problem is she's downstairs, I'm upstairs. I'm typically, while I'm, I'm working, I'll, I'll have some music playing. And uh, so I won't hear her and she would get mad. So we put a little doorbell. Uh, button thing and uh, that solves the problem uh, so yeah let's see uh, so yeah division of labor this is an, an immensely difficult problem and I, I think if we're actually going to get commercial product we're going to need teams but we don't dare assemble teams until we understand the, the process clearly enough to delegate responsibility. Uh, can you elaborate how an event is both an object and a process? Is it the act of triggering an algorithm process that manipulates data? Well, yeah, process alters object. Um, and so an event is really a process altering an object. And so uh, if I, open the pen. There's a process of me using my hands to, open, to pull the pen apart. The pen is the object and the event is the opening. So events are really, they're, like, they're sentences. Subject, mm -hmm. Chris, verb, open, direct object, pen. Uh, so it's an instant of a process manipulating an object? Yeah, it's a different dimension. It's not like a form of process. It's there's process here, object here, event down here. In the same way that we have noun, verb, and sentence. A sentence is not a noun, it's not a verb, it's a combination of them that has meaning that they individually do not have. So, I mean, we can talk about open in very abstract terms, but if we want to talk about a particular event, Chris opened the pen. So that's specific to, here's another interesting thing. Remember, process is localized to time and object is localized to space. And uh, well, an event is localized in both time and space. I opened the pen here in my office at this particular time. So isn't this all terribly cute? Uh, okay, last question. Uh, could we diminish the load of the software by coupling it with a storyteller, a human being like the GM, held by his big rule book of 300 pages? The rule book of 300 pages should be the program. Uh, I made a game with colleagues in two weeks using an asymmetrical gameplay. One storyteller is choosing the story path of the other player is living. I have other game ideas based on human versus human more than human versus computer. It's certainly immensely easier to do this human versus human. Uh, I mean, that's grandpa and Annie. Uh, so yeah, we can already do that. Uh, the problem is how do we do it with a computer? And if you don't have to do it with a computer. If you want to go talk to Annie, you know, go ahead. Okay, one last question, and then we close it. Um, thought, if the interactions of the player in a game are processes or verbs, finding actions that are very versatile, versatile, like the verb to be that is used in many places and ways in sentences, can be used to let the player to create many sentences. 
Uh, yes, that's the idea of a sentence with additional objects or adverbs, modifiers, and so forth. And in fact, I had a generalized system for this in my language system I called dicto, which is a, uh, in which a sentence consists of a subject, a verb, and up to, I think, 12 other objects which are whose role is defined by the verb so the verb um, give takes two objects the object being given and the person to whom uh, it, it is given whereas the verb um, die has no objects it just has a subject and a verb and then you can get <laughs> Boy, I spent so much energy on this problem. The verb make a deal has a whole bunch of objects. That is, the simplest version is uh, subject makes deal, direct object, um, trading A, object A for object B. Um, but you could extend it to clauses. Subject makes a deal with direct object, in which subject promises to do verb A with all of its objects, in return for which direct object uh, promises to do verb B with all of its direct objects. You can get really hairy here. I will say this much, uh, this kind of recursion, you don't wanna get into this, not at this early stage. I've played with it. <laughs> Boy, it gets really complicated really fast. So avoid that. You run into a similar problem with anticipation, which is a process form of recursion. So anyway, I'm going to call it quits. So I'm going to leave the meeting going though. I will simply leave it, but you should be able to uh, uh, continue it. Who wants to stay the longest? I need somebody to hand the meeting off to. So, you wanna do it, George? Okay, so I need to assign a new, oh, I need to stop the recording.